Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the network where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. We plan to be live in at least two different courtrooms, maybe three. Lot to break down. Let's get started. Okay, this trial has started right up in the very beginning. Let's break it down. What's happened so far? Joining me is criminal defense attorney Matthew Maddox. Matthew, great to have you here on Law and Crime. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Now, this is an interesting case to follow. It's both an abuse and murder trial. Um, how's the prosecution doing so far at establishing both levels here? Because it's you, you have both. Uh, one can lead into the other. But I mean, maybe they're help. Maybe they're clearly establishing abuse. But are they really establishing murder here? What do you think? Well, I, well there's not establishing murder yet. I think we know that jurors and 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 people in general. Uh, respect scientists and medicine generally and medical science uh, above almost any other profession. So they're building this track record with this type of testimony, which, of course, also builds credibility and a history here. I think they certainly are demonstrating abuse. They haven't shown murder yet, but um, the track record and the history and the medicine and the science that shows that may show abusive behavior is certainly going to substantiate or bootstrap a murder argument later. Right, they're charged with a litany of crimes, but you could have the scenario where maybe you do have abusive foster parents, but on the day in question, the night in question, this girl really did, as they say, die as an accident from choking on chicken. We're gonna talk more about this a little bit later on. It's time to take a break. When we come back, we'll be live. Stay tuned. All right, Matthew, as we hear this back and forth right now about was it abuse, was there not abuse, what did he observe, did, was there proper documentation? How did the defense do at casting some doubt as whether or not there was abuse or not? Well, first of all, I like her demeanor. She's uh, businesslike, uh, but she's not um, overly aggressive. And she's doing what any experienced criminal defense attorney would do, which is to go after policies and procedures where protocols followed, what are the standard, you know, what are the standard expectations in that office? Um, and she made her point that the, the child went in for vaccinations and for no other purpose. I thought that she was pretty effective. Now, as we watch the defendants, there are two defendants here. They're charged with similar but different crimes. Yes, they both face counts related to aggravated abuse and cruelty to children, but the, the terms of murder are different. He's charged with one count of murder in the second degree. She's charged with malice murder and three counts of felony murder. Does that indicate to you that the state doesn't exactly know, uh, doesn't know exactly, excuse me, how Layla died and they might be cast, casting a wide net? If so, what's the jury supposed? to do here I, I it's clear that with with those types of charges and and those somewhat moderate distinctions they are casting a very wide net also very typical of most prosecutions with uh, co-defendants or multiple co-defendants and the this is always a concern when we are trying cases to juries where there's a lot of medical information a lot of scientific information and a lack of specificity and asking jurors to parse medical information is a significant task. It's a significant task even for medical professionals, let alone for lay people. So that's difficult. And, and, and go ahead. No, I was going to say, is there a possibility that he could be found not guilty of some charges while she could be found guilty across the board? I mean, in a case where the jury comes back and finds guilt in both cases? I mean, again, the, it's been so much about Jennifer doing the abuse that you haven't heard so much about Joseph. Well, this is, I, I, that's certainly a possibility, but you know, this this also calls in the, the question, the topic, that the fact that this lawyer is representing both co-defendants, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it, the, uh, you know, this, that possibility of a split verdict or for the defense attorney representing co-defendants in a grievously important case that the co-defendant, the husband is kind of caught up and convicted on all counts also the argument later is going to be that she was in a conflict and was un unable to represent both of them effectively. That would be my concern. Yeah, well, she's representing two people who said they never abused these girls. They had nothing to do with what happened. They're completely innocent. It's not like they're casting blame on one parent as opposed to the other. We'll see how it goes. Let's go back live. A new witness has just taken the stand. Well, Matthew, the Department of Family and Child Services, they always play a big role in any of these kinds of cases. How do you think it's going to factor into this case? Um, I, I think that the more the jury hears about official involvement and, you know, investigative agency involvement in these children's and these and this family's lives, 
the more the state is building a case of abuse. Uh, it's very hard when when they, when they're building up evidence of an official nature. It's very hard for jurors to, uh, as I said earlier, parse through that and diminish the impact of that testimony. Yep, very well said. All right, let's go uh, take a break. And when we come back, we're going to hear more about what happened to these girls. Stay tuned. All right, so as this witness leaves and we wait for the next witness to jump on the stand, let's get some more, perspe more perspective from Matthew Maddox. Matthew, one of the other interesting aspects of this case is, you know, the, the defendants are saying that this little girl choked on a piece of chicken and that they were trying to resuscitate her. As a result, that's why you see all these injuries internally, that there was such pressure put on her abdomen. Do you buy that? It's very hard to buy that. You know, and I'm a defense attorney. Um, that's a that's a very very hard story to uh, endorse yeah, as a lawyer, and I think it's going to be very difficult for this jury. Well, that I mean, it seems I always thought that this was going to come down to a battle of experts saying that perhaps if you resuscitate a child of that age, a two-year-old, and you put too much pressure, perhaps that's what could cause this. I mean, doesn't the case just rest on what happened that very night? Yes, they, they've been charged with child abuse, and yes, it tells the overall pattern, but isn't it so important to get that battle of the experts? Well, the, the experts, of course, they, they, they are the ones who really affect the balance of the entire case, as you know, Jesse. Um, and the story of what happened last night, are we, are we going to hear from these defendants? I doubt that, right? Um, so who's going to tell that story other than experts? Uh, it's, it's going to be expert testimony. Yeah, I don't think we're going to hear from these two. Uh, that would be surprising. But hey, I've seen weirder things happen. New witnesses on the stand. Let's go live. Hey, Matthew, this is interesting. She, along with another caseworker, Samantha White, were both terminated as a result of this case. She's claiming at the time that they didn't think that there was this level of abuse, even though there was indications and they kept the DFCS kept being called. Now the defense is in a position where, you correct me if I'm wrong, they're trying to take her word for it and say, well, you didn't observe abuse, but doesn't that not really work because she was fired for this case? Yeah, this, this becomes such a dangerous double-edged sword for the defense. You know, and, and in these abuse cases involving children who are living on the margins, Jesse, DCF and, and these types of officials, it, I would say, become almost unnamed co-defendants. Um, and, and, and you can see, these are, even, even if she hadn't been terminated, they're not impressing with a great deal of competence. They don't, they're not masters of the information and the records. And uh, the defense attorney trying to get the jury to rely upon what this person did or didn't do, I think um, actually just makes a jury want to help this child even more. And I think that's what happens unconsciously. These juries start to think, you know, nobody took care of her, we gotta take care of her. That's one way of looking at it, especially when you're talking about the parents are not biological parents. They were put in, these kids were put into this system. They were put into that household. So it's when something happens like this, there's a lot of explaining to do, including for the DFCS. We'll take a break. When we come back, we're planning on jumping live. Stay tuned.